the next issue that we want to discuss is that of uh, that of discretization error in finite element solutions and again we we work it out uh, with a very simple example that of uh, bar 1d bar which is subjected to a force a body force of q by a so q is the force per unit length q by a is the body force so that the governing equation like we have done before is d sigma xx dx plus bx bx is q by a equal to zero this is the governing differential equation and from this we can obtain this in terms of the displacement so we have the governing equation with second order derivatives in displacement and now if we if we discretize it in with uh, linear truss elements so this is xi this is xi plus one these are the nodal coordinates and then we know the shape functions for this are <coughs> at any point x here the shape functions are one minus x minus xi by hi where hi is the length of this element so is the element size this is n one and n2 is x minus xi by hi so these are the these are the shape functions these are the shape functions and uh, with these shape functions you can write the u at any point inside the element you can write the u at any point inside the element as this so this is your assumed u which we call u h x and this is the real u which is the solution to this equation the exact solution to this equation so the error is u minus u h and u h is this quantity so this is the error now uh, we can use the Rolle's theorem uh, which states that within this interval uh, there must be a point where okay so 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 one more thing that we assume here is that the error at this point is and this point the errors at these points are zero so error at x i and error at x i plus one both are zero because at the nodes uh, we have uh, uh, at the nodes the displacements are exact now um, okay now uh, by Rolle's theorem if uh, e x is a function which starts at zero here and ends at zero here so by Rolle's theorem we must have the a point where e prime z is equal to zero it if it has to start from zero and end at zero there must be a point somewhere uh, we call this point z there must be a point somewhere where the slope of the curve is equal to zero <coughs> so using this we can we can prove very easily that uh, the the uh, derivative of the error the first derivative of the error the magnitude of the first derivative of the error is bounded by one the element size and second the maximum value of the second derivative of u so if the second derivative of u is uh, u double prime the maximum value of it between xi and xi plus one is the other factor that governs the magnitude of this quantity which is the derivative of the error function so it is this is like the error in strain the error in strain is uh, e prime is equal to u prime uh, minus the strain that you have calculated from that you calculate from this which is a constant strain uh, so uh, the error e prime is actually the error in strain and the error in strain is bounded by the element size and the maximum value of the second derivative of the displacement function the actual displacement function uh, it's actually uh, not very difficult to prove this result i'll just give you an outline of the proof so uh, so let's write so let's assume that e z z is the point x equal to z is the point where e prime z is equal to zero that means 
uh, this point and then so I have uh, xi here xi plus 1 here ux is a function which is 0 at both ends ex sorry ex is a function which is 0 at both ends and where its slope is parallel to the x-axis is x equal to z so e prime z is equal to 0. So if e prime z is equal to 0 that then at any point let's say x or any point x here let's take it on the on the right hand side at any point x we can write uh, e prime z e prime x as e prime x minus e prime z which is equal to e prime x itself because e prime z is 0 uh, as uh, integral of from z to x of e double prime uh, taken over this interval. So we can take <coughs> Uh, from here to here we can take e double prime integrate it to get the e prime at this point that's what we have done here and the second derivative of e prime e double prime will be u double prime because the second derivative of of this part it's it's linear in x so the second derivative of this is zero so e double prime is equal to u double prime and that's what we have used so you can basically get the derivative of the error at x in terms of the integral from z to x of u double prime so uh, now we use some standard results this the magnitude of this the magnitude of u double prime has to be less than or equal to the integral of uh, magnitude of u double prime from z to x uh, which has to be less than so if if i replace this by xi and xi plus one it has to be less than that and then this has to be less than uh, hi times the maximum value of u double prime so this is the integral of u double prime of course this will be less than the, if you take the maximum value and multiply it by hi so um, so the maximum value of u double prime multiplied by hi will be uh, greater than always the u double prime integrated from one node to the other so this proves uh, that uh, the error magnitude of the error in the strain so this is the error in strain So magnitude of the error in strain, at least for this kind of an element, is bounded by the element size and the second derivative of the displacement. We can similarly find the error in uh, uh, we can find the error in uh, displacements. That means we can find the magnitude of e x in pretty much a similar way. Now uh, let us try to bound the error in the displacement itself. So error in the displacement uh, as we have defined is E. Now let us say, let us think that uh, this is Xi, this is Xi plus 1 and then U varies like this so that you have a point Z where E prime Z is equal to zero so this is e x so at the point where e prime z is equal to zero obviously your error in strain is equal to zero so error is error in strain is exactly equal to zero here now let us look at the error in displacements now let us assume uh, that z is closer to xi than to xi plus one it can be closer to xi plus one and the proof will go ahead as usual as as I am I'm going to show now let us suppose for the moment that z is closer to xi plus 1 so I'm going to write the error in xi error at xi in terms of the error at z so error at xi is error at z plus uh, this term which depends on the derivative at z which is equal to 0 and then this term this is the second term in the Taylor series and now because uh, 
uh, z is closer to x i rather than to x i plus 1, then mod of z minus, this should be z, I'm sorry, this should be z. So z minus x i has to be less than the half, the half the length. And if you put that here, this will be h i square by 4, which means, and, and we have already discussed the bounds on, uh, we have already discussed the bounds on uh, e double prime and e double prime uh, with those bounds on e double prime, uh, we can now show that error in displacement is equal to, is less than equal to one eighth of h i square. So if you half the size of the elements, the error in displacements would go one fourth, whereas the error in strain, which depends on, uh, which depends on h i only, will be halved. Uh, also, what you can what you can see clearly is that e prime z is zero at this point, which means the strain is most accurate in the interior of the element, whereas the displacements the displacements are accurate close to the nodes of the element. Displacements are accurate at the nodes. The strains are accurate. The first derivatives of the strains are accurate at the interior. So in general, if uh, your shape functions contain complete polynomials of order p, we have looked at this result before, and 2m is the highest degree of the derivative in the field variable, and h is a measure of element size, then discretization errors in the field quantity go as h to the power p plus 1, whereas uh, in the rth derivative, it goes as h to the power p plus 1 minus r. So if you take a three-noded triangle and four-noded quads, then p is equal to 1. The complete polynomial hidden in them is equal to 1. So in a plane stress, plane strain problem, if we change from four-noded quads to eight-noded quads, the discretization error will change from uh, order h square to order h cube because um, p equal to 1 for a 4 noted quad, p equal to 2 for a 8 noted quad and uh, so p plus 1 will be 3 for a 8 noted quad. So you will have h cube, order of h cube as the error and order of h square will be the error for 4 noted. Again, if uh, for a four noded element, the mesh is halved, the, uh, the error will reduce by one fourth, four times, error will reduce to one fourth. And in a eight noded element, if you half the, half the element size, it will reduce by one eighth. But you must remember uh, that when Whereas the error reduces by one eighth, the number of nodes, the number of degrees of freedom that you have to solve for also increases because eight noded quads will have uh, 16 degrees of freedom, whereas four noded ones will have eight degrees of freedom each. So every element you add, you add about 16 more degrees of freedom in the, uh, in the mesh. So uh, these are considerations that you have to, uh, have to keep in mind while uh, designing a finite element problem. So uh, what are these considerations? The considerations are like whether you are going to use a fine mesh or whether you are going to use uh, mesh with uh, uh, elements with a lot of nodes. Also remember that the best strains will be obtained at the integration points inside the element, whereas the best values of displacement will be obtained at uh, the nodes of the elements. Also, the uh, the values of the displacement are likely to be much more accurate. For the given mesh, the values of the displacements are likely to be more accurate than the values of the strain. The strains are going to be about an, uh, about 1 by h less accurate than uh, displacements. So the next problem that we want to discuss is the problem of element locking. So let me try and explain what this means. For example, uh, let's say uh, element has a local stiffness matrix Ke, and then we can have a, a eigenvalue problem uh, 
set up as ke times v equal to lambda v. This is the problem we would solve if you want to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of ke. So what this means is that v is of course has the dimensions of displacement. So these are like uh, a vector of nodal degrees of freedom. Uh, but the forces that you have applied on the right hand side, the forces are um, proportional to the displacements. So you, you, you apply forces that are in the same direction as the displacements and proportional to them. So if you want to solve, if you solve this problem, you get, if this is n cross n, you get uh, eigenvectors which are vi and eigenvalues which are lambda i and you get n of them. Uh, these are orthonormal, uh, these are orthonormal vectors and you probably know that uh, if I if I take vi transpose ke vi, I get lambda i. If I take vi transpose ke vj, I get zero. So uh, this is what I get, but uh, you can also see that this quantity here has is the energy stored for these displacements vi. So this uh, lambda i gives you the energy stored in uh, the ith mode of ke, that is uh, the energy stored due to the ith eigenvector of uh, the element stiffness matrix. Now, uh, since these uh, these vi are normalized and uh, and perpendicular vectors, so for uh, for example, for a four nodded element, they would be like vectors with eight elements each, and these elements, so this would be eight cross one vectors. Each vi would be an eight cross one vector, and these quantities represent displacements for the various degrees of freedom, just like any other displacement, and then we can plot for each eigenvalue, each of the eight eigenvalues of a four-noded uh, rectangular element. We can plot these displacements on the original element itself. So this is what we get then. Uh, what you see is there are three rigid body uh, degrees, rigid body um, modes, uh, which correspond to the three eigenvectors with zero eigenvalues. So these are rigid body modes correspond to zero eigenvalues and they correspond to translation in the x, translation in the y and the rotation about the z-axis. These are the rigid body modes. Then you have flexural modes and then you have a stretching mode uh, which is a stretch in one direction and the contraction in the other and then the, you have a uniform extension mode which is an equal, equal stretch in both directions. So these are the possible modes of a four-noded quadrilateral element. You can find the modes for any, any element by solving its eigenvalue problem and then plotting the eigenvectors. Now, uh, what this means is that a, a eight-noded, eight-noded, uh, sorry, a four-noded uh, rectangular element is capable of only these kinds of motions or any deformation that can be thought of as a combination of these eight, uh, eight different uh, eigenvectors. Uh, of course, uh, in most meshes, you will, you will have uh, boundary conditions that will rule out the rigid body modes. And then uh, these are the five modes that have to constitute all the deformation modes that the element can suffer. Uh, now, this might lead to some problems uh, in cases where you are trying to trying to uh, approximate, a, approximate a displacement pattern that cannot be construed as a combination of these eight. For example, a very simple example arises in the case of beam bending. Suppose that you have a beam and you have discretized it you have a beam uh, which is subjected to n moments and you have discretized it with one element per thickness over the thickness. So uh, each element here, each element here uh, 
in reality, this beam will bend into the arc of a circle. This beam will bend into an arc and this arc uh, will have a radius of curvature which if this angle is theta b, the radius of curvature will be theta b by uh, 2a will be uh, 1 uh, will be kappa the radius of curvature and then we know from beam theory that epsilon xx will be minus kappa times y where y is the distance from the neutral axis and epsilon yy will of course be nu times kappa times y and epsilon xy for pure euler bernoulli beam theory will be equal to 0. So uh, this all hinges on the fact that the beam bends into a circle. So this element will deform into this kind of a shape. Okay. If the element is able to deform in this kind of a shape, then uh, these would be the strains that he will encounter and he will be able to solve this problem exactly. Now, if you are using four noded quads, uh, these modes, these all these eight modes uh, cannot be superimposed in any way, cannot be combined in any way to produce a displacement of this sort. Uh, because as you can see, in all these modes, the edges remain straight. There are, you can, there is no combination that you can use to, uh, to make these edges, make these edges uh, second order polynomials. It's just not possible. So uh, the best can, it can do is undergo this kind of a shape. And if it undergoes this kind of a shape and you calculate, so, so let's suppose this length and this length are the same, this length and this length are the same. Using that, if you calculate the strains, those strains would be uh, this with the minus, this and this. So uh, as you can see that uh, that shear strain has to be zero, but you will actually encounter a shear strain which is proportional to uh, theta El by 2a. Okay. Now this is called parasitic shear because this will not be there. This will not be there. This should not have been there. This should not have been there. So uh, this is called parasitic shear. Now if you uh, assume that uh, this moment and this moment, you are applying the same moments at the ends of the beam, uh, then you can calculate the ratio between this angle that the finite element mesh will take and the actual angle that is expected and this is what you will get and what you can see from here as a by b ratio increases the problem of theta el deviating from theta b becomes worse and worse uh, a by b reducing means as the beam gets thinner and thinner this is to be this is uh, to be so uh, the beam gets thinner and thinner as the beam gets thinner and thinner uh, you will have a worse and worse problem of theta el deviating from theta b and this is known as shear locking and this is basically happening because the four noded element is not uh, designed to capture a situation where the shear strain is equal to zero so that is the reason why this locking is happening. Uh, the locking can happen due to other reasons also. Let us let us look at them. So one of the other reasons where locking can happen is in near incompressible materials which have a new that uh, is very close to half. So uh, consider a isotropic material in a linear elastic problem. This is the isotropic Cijkl, the stiffness matrix, and it is written as a six cross six matrix. We have done that. Now, uh, let us split it up into two parts. So instead of using lambda and mu, let us use mu and the bulk modulus as the two constants in this relationship. 
and the bulk modulus is related to uh, mu and lambda through this relation which you might have seen in your courses on elasticity. So if you do that then we can split this 6 cross 6 matrix that we make out of Cij KL into a mu part and a k part and they look like this. So uh, I, I first write this equation in terms of mu and k and then I uh, write down this matrix form where this is C1111, this is C1122, this is C1133 and this is C1123 uh, and so on. This is C1112. Uh, I write it down like this. So here I write the mu part of C, the part that depends on mu. So the mu is outside and here I write the same quantities that are dependent on k and so on. So uh, k, if I express it in terms of lambda and 2 mu, lambda and mu is this expression. If I express it in terms of e and nu, it is this expression which you might be aware and you can see that as nu tends to 0.5, k will go to infinity which means this part, this part of the stiffness of the stiffness will go to infinity as well. So uh, that is a, that may cause a problem because uh, because we have split the modulus into this two parts where C k is uh, C k is this this is C k this is C mu. So we have split it into mu times C mu plus k times C k, and when you have done that we can put it, put this into the potential energy. So remember potential energy is uh, integral over the volume uh, sigma ij epsilon ij dv with a half. So uh, in place of uh, sigma ij we put uh, we put uh, C i j k l epsilon k l. So we write it as C i j k l epsilon i j epsilon k l and then uh, we use the fact that C i j k l is mu C i j k l uh, mu plus k C i j k l k to split the strain energy term so this is this this is the this is the strain energy i'm sorry this is the strain energy so the potential energy is the strain energy minus the potential of the loads and now we have split the strain energy term into two parts one containing cijkl mu and the other containing cijkl k and when you do this as mu tends to 0.5 this becomes infinity so it becomes very very difficult to satisfy, to minimize, minimize this quantity pi. And that is a kind of locking that happens. In fact, uh, you can, you can split, you can split the uh, K matrix as well into a mu part and a K part. Uh, since uh, C mu is split into, C is split into a mu part and a K part, uh, you can split B transpose CB, B transpose CB, remember, is your uh, is your stiffness and this stiffness matrix can be split into uh, mu times c mu plus k times c k to uh, get these two terms and as mu tends to infinity mu tends to 0.5 k will tend to infinity now for every element how do we how do how can we prevent this from happening suppose mu is very close to 0.5 and I still want to solve the problem. Uh, so, so let's see if, if there, there is any way out. Now remember the way we are going to solve this problem, the way we are going to solve this problem is by doing numerical integration on this in, on these integral and these integral. So, uh, so we have now the choice of using say mth order, mth, nth order Gauss quadrature for this integral then this becomes a summation from i equal to 1 to n 
of mu times w i uh, b transpose c b times j evaluated at point i and then this is the mth order so this is i equal to 1 to m again evaluated at point i now we can have a situation where m is equal to n which means we use the same orders to evaluate these two so that is the required order but uh, we can also use a lower order for m we can also use a lower order for m uh, in which case the second term is under integrated so under integration may seem like a bad idea because under integration means not you are not evaluating it exactly but we will see that under integration sometimes might help you solve the problem that arises due to an infinite bulk modulus let us see how that happens now if you have done a course on optimization or invariational uh, methods you would know that equation uh, terms of this kind are called constraint equations so uh, this is a quantity that uh, goes to infinity that can go to infinity as mu tends to 0.5 and if uh, you still have to minimize this you still have to minimize this you have the constraint that uh, the volumetric strains which are hidden in this term actually the volumetric strains have to go to zero so this equation to 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 be able to solve the problem we have to find the strains in such a way that the volumetric strains have to go to zero and uh, the 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 term in the stiffness matrix due to this constraint equation constraint part of the variational problem is is this so this is like a constraint that you will now have to impose in order to solve the problem and the the meaning of imposing this constraint is that your volumetric strains must come out to be zero in which case no matter how big this quantity is this term is zero so that the product finally comes out to be zero and you have no contribution from from this term that is the only situation where you will be able to solve this problem now now consider a body a simple case where you have a body which is this and you are adding elements you are adding these elements you have added the blue elements and you are going to add the red so for this mesh for every element added if these elements are four noted quadrilaterals so you have uh, nodes here 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 these three nodes already existed in the mesh and for every element added you have added a new node here which means you have added two degrees of freedom so then we uh, uh, compute this a quantity called nd nd is equal to 2 this is the number of degrees of freedom added for every node introduced now how many constraint equations have we added here we have added we do uh, if we do a full integration then n will be equal to 4 because i am doing 2 cross 2 gauss quadrature m will also be equal to 4 so four new such equations have to be satisfied four new constraint equations will be added so then we can find a, a constraint ratio which is nd divided by the number of constraint equations added which is 2 by 4 equal to one half now this is uh, the constraint ratio and the constraint ratio about the constraint ratio the thumb rule is that if the constraint ratio is one or lower if it's if it's the if it's about one if it's around one then the mesh will be locked if the constraint ratio is too high if it's much greater than one then the mesh uh, the the constraints are not properly imposed so an optimal constraint ratio is about equal to the dimension of the problem so keeping this thumb rule in mind now let us see what happens if instead of integrating uh, integrating this term correct exactly we use m equal to 1 for first order gauss quadrature so if we use m equal to 1 that means we are under integrating the uh, under integrating the term 
containing k which is what is going to infinity in that case we will be adding again nd is equal to 2 but this is equal to 1 so r will become 2 by 1 and this is obviously the optimal in case of a 2d problem now uh, that is the advantage of under integration under integration will allow me to escape locking of the mesh escape locking of the mesh escape the from the situation where the mesh behaves much more stiffly and therefore gives much less displacements than it actually should now i can uh, i can uh, do several other things i can use a, a quad with uh, nine nodes i can use a quad with nine nodes with a center node as well so if i use a quad with nine nodes then for these uh, for this red element i will add one two three and four nodes center central node also i'll add four nodes therefore eight degrees of freedom so r will be equal to eight and if i do a four cross four two cross two gauss quadrature if i do a two cross two gauss quadrature i will have four that will be equal to two again so this will be optimal as well so for this nine nodal element no matter what is the correct uh, correct integration order for this term i use m equal to 4 in that case i will have i will have uh, properly imposed the constraint of zero um, zero volumetric strain uh, if i use uh, four integration points i will impose zero volumetric strain quite easily and my r will be equal to 2. Uh, if I don't use this, if I don't use this node and still use four Gauss points, then I have I will be adding for every element I'll be adding one, two, three nodes, and then r will be six divided by four, which is uh, three by two, uh, which is still less than the dimension of the problem, which is two, and this will also lead to locking. So if you want to prevent locking, you have two ways. One is use a four node at quad, but use one uh, one integration point under integrate uh, under integrate the volumetric term under integrate this term, or you use second order Gauss quadrature for this term and use uh, quadratic uh, use a quadratic uh, quad with a central node.